Welcome to the Node Gardens YouTube channel where we discuss blockchain, cryptography, smart contract programming, and much more. I am today with Marcelo Bardus, who is the co-founder of Hero Dotus, uh, co-hosting this episode as usual with Kayleen. Marcelo, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you? Hey, I'm um, doing great. Thank you for having me here today. Ah, man, it's a pleasure. So could you please briefly introduce yourself, how you came to create Herodotus, mm -hmm. the whole backstory behind the project, and uh, yeah, why is it also called like that? That's uh, quite a big question. Sure. Cool, yeah, so I would say I'm the technical person behind Herodotus. I don't know, I guess I should probably also start where I come from. Like I mentioned, I'm a technical person. I was always excited about the research topics in crypto, but most importantly, cryptography. That's also how I actually arrived to the, to the space. Yeah, so that's very briefly. We started Herodotus uh, in June last year. And before I was a geometry researcher, and before that I was at Euler Network and, and other minus, both uh, engineer and, and researcher. So that's kind of where I where I come from. I was super always excited about ZK rollups. Actually, that, that's funny because nowadays I'm mostly within the StarkNet ecosystem, but I kind of started through ZK Sync and writing some stuff in Zinc. Uh, okay, so now about Herodotus. So maybe I'll start from the name because this is funny, uh, speaking of the StarkNet ecosystem. Yeah, so we provide historical data access for smart contracts and also cross rollup data access, meaning that if you're writing a customer contract, let's say on StartNet, you can just freely access whatever state exists on layer one, polygon, and so on. Uh, so this is kind of cool. Okay, I mentioned historical data. And now Herodotus. So Herodotus supposedly was the father of history. And most importantly, he supposedly created the Herodotus machine, which was used to build the pyramids. And you know, the Cairo pyramids, StartNet, and we want to be the underlying machine, which allows to build all this amazing infrastructure and applications. So I thought it's just, just a cool name and, and, and yeah, that's it. So the main thing in Herodotus is storage proofs. So could you explain a little bit about what storage proofs are, why storage proofs and why specifically zero knowledge proofs? Why are you interested so much in them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So maybe before I start talking about storage proof, I will just start by mentioning a statement that blockchains at the end of the day are just a database which has some data in it, which is cryptographically committed in some commitment schemes like Miracle Trees, whatever that is, Miracle Trees, and so on. And the idea behind storage proof is that, hey, as it's all committed, we can actually prove that something is within that database. And this is like super cool if you think of it, right? Because you're on one blockchain, but you want to access some data from other blockchains. So you don't need to trust someone to make an attestation, but you can verify it, right? Because you can just prove that something is literally in the database which is amazing. So I was always vibing with that idea, but it was always problematic before ZK. Why? Because the bigger the database, the bigger, I mean, in most schemes, the bigger is the proof. And it's pretty expensive to verify it on chain. But then suddenly ZKPs just exploded and this tooling became available. And ZKPs provide a very nice utility, a very nice property, which is essentially you can do quite a lot of computation and just verify it on chain. And verification is way, way, way cheaper and most importantly, you can also save on bandwidth because these proofs are pretty big and ZK allows you to kind of hide it. And you just care about, hey, I have a proof that is valid for this database, aka this blockchain. So that's that's it. I just want to bounce back on something you said very quickly. You started exploring ZK Sync, Circom, and then you ended up on StarkNet. Is it only because of the pyramids or there was something else to it? Are you leveraging something on that stack in particular? So actually, I started to do my research and experimentations with uh, ZK DSLs in late 2019. Yeah, and I think that Zinc and Circon were the first languages I tried. Oh, and also Socrates. So actually, maybe this is the reason why I decided to also go with these Greek names, Socrates and then Herodotus. Yeah, but uh, to give you like very, very short, I just got Stark built quite early while I was in Nethermind. I had the pleasure to work with the Starkware guys. And yeah, I got the pleasure to explore Cairo and it just happened. And then suddenly StartNet became a thing and I was like, oh, okay, that's that's super cool. Let's uh, let's do even more stuff with it. Okay. And so with this storage proofs, what you are basically able to do, you correct me if I'm wrong, you're repackaging a lot of data into a small data, into a succinct proof that can be read by a smart contract for cheap. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so could you give us at a high level the big use cases that could derive from 
such a technological primitive existing on a layer two or a layer one? Mm -hmm. Sure. So maybe I'll start from the fact that we can do some pre-computation. I mean, computation off-chain and then just post the result on-chain and be sure that the output is valid. So that said, we can take an insanely big database as a whole blockchain and just process it and, cre and literally compress it. And that's what we kind of do at Herodotus. And then this proof of compressing a blockchain can land, let's say, on, on StartNet. Um, because if we have it on StartNet, we can just access whatever is on mainnet and also whatever is appearing on mainnet. And that said, we literally, in some way, remove the need of messaging. So one of the cool use cases is snapshot X, where essentially uh, you can vote on some assets you have on the one without even bridging them. Because what you care about is just to prove that, hey, I have the right to participate in this DAO. Okay. And there is and no message flowing between StartNet and, and Ethereum. And so the vote is set on a checkpoint of the state of the blockchain at a given moment. So you cannot really cheat your way out, right? Yeah. Okay. Could you just clarify the difference between that there is between a storage proof and a validity proof? I would try to keep it simple. So validity proofs allow you to prove that some computation was done correctly, whereas a storage proof is allows you to prove that something is within some data set. Oh, okay. So yeah, well, with this validity proof, you transform the execution trace and you, you can yep. prove that things happen in a certain order. Well, yeah, for these storage proofs, they yeah, it's, it's static. So I would assume that it's easier to compute? Compute storage proofs or... Yeah, yeah storage proofs. proofs. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're like way easier. At the end of the day, just Merkle proofs. These Merkle proofs are big and quite expensive to verify. And that's why we use Snarks for it because it just combines pretty well with each other's. Can you verify snarks and StartNet yet? I mean, not yet, but soon you will be able to. These pairings things they're working on, I've, I've heard that. Okay, yeah. very cool. But by the way, it's uh, not a very known fact, but uh, Starks are snarks, technically talking. So, ah, We'll try to get to that a bit later in the podcast. Yeah, straight to the point. I'm a dev, a Solidity dev, let's say, like quite some people in those guardians, and I want to build using Herodotus. I assume that you guys are doing through audits. Not everything is public, but how can I learn more first? And how can I build with Herodotus now or in the near future? Sure. So first of all, we encourage you to check our docs and also some of the examples we have on our GitHub on how you can build stuff on top of us. So currently, we just expose some very friendly APIs. You just say, hey, I'm, I'm on StartNet and I want to access some data from Ethereum from this specific block. And the data I want to access is, let's say, this balance. Obviously, there is a specific way to encode this intent um, and yeah, in the background, Herodotus is going to prepare the proof for you and either deliver it to you off chain or post it on, on behalf of you on, on StarCraft or whatever the destination chain is. However, like we'll also be able in the coming weeks to schedule this request on chain, meaning that a smart contract itself can request some data from L1 because not currently it works in a way that you need to make an off chain call. That says, hey, I'm a StartNet, I want this data. We prepare you the proof, and then you just post the proof on your own. So it's always like the end user, you know, like not, not a smart contract to ask for the specific data. In the coming weeks, also smart contracts will be able to do that. So again, I highly encourage you to check our GitHub and also follow us on Twitter. And, and most importantly, our docs. The end goal is to literally write on-chain queries and say, select whatever, whatever from Polygon and so on, for example. Okay, and the main thing here is that everything has to be built. If I want to build my application that reads the state of Arbitrum and Optimism, but it actually exists on StarkNet, I need to write that specific, let's say, chunk of code query contract in order to make this possible. All that infrastructure is yet to be built, right? The APIs are already live, but the queries are coming in some near future. Okay, and the whole computation part of Herodotus what kind of costs are we talking about? Is it like some huge AWS instance that parallelizes the generation of the proof on repeat every like 10 minutes? Is it the yep. way it works? Yeah. Okay. And this is subsidized by the consumers of Herodotus product? How does that work? What's the, the fee model? I think the coolest part of Herodotus is that essentially we act as a, some sort of coordinator. Because we aggregate multiple requests, it means that we see what type of data is currently being demanded and we can mutualize the cost between everyone who's interested in that. So using the Herodotus API is just the cheapest way to essentially access that data, because otherwise you need to do the computation on your own. It's a pretty similar model to the shared one of the products provided by Starkware. It's yeah, literally sure. like a, 
a short prover, but for state. Okay, very cool. And we can build bridges with storage proofs in a way. If we can prove the balance uh, that someone has at instant T and et cetera and et cetera, uh, we can work some kind of bridge out of this. Uh, yep. We keep hearing a lot about ZK IBC, ZK bridges, uh, zero knowledge bridges. How do these actually differ from the Herodotus solution? So Herodotus in some way removes the need of messaging because we allow to literally prove that something happened on the other side by just providing cryptographic proof. And also, most importantly, Herodotus currently provides L2 to L2 access and L1 to L2, whereas ZK bridges are mostly focused on L1 to L1, as, as this is a pretty different problem to solve. But obviously, there is a huge intersection of, uh, of problems you need to solve in order to make it possible. But yeah, I would say ZK bridges mostly solve the problem of L1 to L1 communication, whereas Herodotus wants to fix the problem of data access and proving data integrity from one data set to another. So everything's synchronous. Okay, very cool. Yeah. And for instance, on Starknet and on other rollups, ACAN abstraction is already implemented. What's the relationship between storage proofs and ACAN abstraction? I, I think it's a pretty powerful combination actually, because account abstraction allows you to do essentially whatever you want with your account, and you can programmatically set some rules. And with storage proofs, you can access the past. So for example, what you can do, you can say, hey, uh, if I don't use this, account abstraction wallet for more than three months, it means that I somehow lost access to it. And I can prove that I lost access to it thanks to storage proofs. And if I prove it, I can trigger some specific recovery mechanism. So this is a pretty nice, nice use case. Or you could even implement some sort of account abstraction wallet that relies on data coming from different chains, which is also pretty powerful, I think. And so Herodotus is very interesting in the world of L1, L2, l freeze, but as we've explored it in the previous episode, we start to see more modular technical propositions, let's say, where people get to actually focus on the execution environment and use an external, let's say, data availability solution, whether it's Ethereum or a committee or something like Celestia. How would Herodotus and its storage proofs actually fit in that landscape? Quite often, I like to pitch Herodotus as a new way to open more dimensions because if you think of it, nowadays we build on-chain applications in a pretty 2D way. Why? Because the first dimension is I can access the state of my own contract and to some limited extent the state of other contracts and to an even more limited state of other contracts on different rollups by just sending messages. But we're missing one very important dimension, which is time. So this is also enabled by Herodotus. And another dimension is accessing whatever is in the broad Ethereum ecosystem. So I think, yes, for Herodotus, it doesn't really matter if it's going to be like some data on L4 being accessed by L1. In terms of like rollups and the infrastructure that you're providing, can you explain how parallelizable storage proofs provide sort of this like infrastructure for rollups on like layer twos or layer threes or even layer fours? For sure, we can uh, parallelize the whole process of like proving a chain. And this is actually what, what we do. Because if you think of it like for nowadays, Ethereum is like 16 million blocks. That's quite of a lot. In order to prove the whole chain, we need to use parallelized proving. And this is something we definitely do. But the process of like generating storage proofs is, is actually not a bottleneck of Herodotus. The main bottleneck is, as, as usual, ZK proving, generating the actual validity proofs. Okay, and for fellow cryptography enthusiasts in the, in the community, could you dive a little bit deeper in the schemes, the type of proofs you're using, the provers, uh, and all the, the magic behind the Herodotus machine? Sure. So, like I mentioned, we do a few different things. So, one is proving the whole chain and like generating this gigantic accumulator. It allows you to access whatever ever happened on the specific chain, aka state routes, receipt routes, I don't know, base fees, and so on. And this is a lot of computation. So when you need to do a lot of computation, you don't really care about the verification cost. You mostly care about the, the proving cost. So for that, we use Starks. And then when it comes to accessing something from the accumulator, let's say you want to access, I don't know, the state route from three months ago. And from that state route, you want to prove some ERC20 balance. This is not that much computation. It's quite unfeasible to use Starks as they, they are pretty big and the call data cost is significant. We use uh, Starks for it. And depending on where this proof is being verified, we use different proving systems. You know, proofs are call data at the end of the day. And on each rollup, the call data cost is different. So depending what are the trade-offs, we just choose different proving systems from Graph16 to Halo2 and so on. 
Okay. Oh, and cool. most importantly, the API abstracts it. So if you're using Herodotus, you don't even need to care about if you're using Starks, Halo 2, Graph 16, and so on. Very cool. Now we want some hot takes since you're deep into working on Herodotus and discharge proofs. What do you think of multi-sig bridges, hub and spokes, or approaches like layer zero for cross-chain communications? I don't like criticizing other teams. However, I'm not a fan of, uh, of multi-sigs, to be honest. Yeah. Especially when it comes to arbitrary messages. Why? Because the idea behind optimistic bridges is that you can deliver a message and then someone can contest it. But if the amount of messages is arbitrary, because you can support arbitrary messages, it's pretty hard to actually monitor that whoever is the relayer is, is honest. And this is my main problem with this type of, of bridges. It kind of Fair makes enough. sense to bridge very specific types of data, like a single block hash because it's very easy to monitor. But when it comes to like any arbitrary message, I'm not a big fan of it. I would just put it like that. Fair enough. And how far are you with the product re release? Like what's the roadmap for your hero daughters? Where are you guys at at the moment? Are you going through audits? What can we expect to see in the coming month? So currently we are live on, on Starknet, only on, on testnets as we are waiting for the regenesis and Cairo 1.0. But in the meantime, we're already working on EVM to EVM, meaning that you will be able to access let's say the state of Arbitrum on Optimism in a synchronous manner, because currently we're only on Starknet, meaning that on Starknet you can access Optimism, Polygon, Mainnet, Arbitrum, and so on. But still you cannot access Starknet on layer one. And yes, this is the, the roadmap. So this is about the, the type of data you'll be able to access. We think that in three months this will be uh, already usable. And apart from that, like I said, the API will support different entry points because currently we only support off-chain, but we're also going to have on-chain entry points. Whereas I mentioned queries, so queries will come maybe in three to four months. So yeah, that's the roadmap. And obviously in the background, you do a lot of optimizations. Okay, very cool. Just one last question regarding composability and building with Herodotus. Let's say you have that money market that is basically going to consider your balances across multiple EDM chains. Yeah. What do I need to exactly build to make this happen? How does that actually work? How can you lock my balance on four multiple chains with a protocol that actually sits on a fifth chain and uh, ensure that, let's say, liquidation of assets are done perfectly? What is exactly going to happen? Uh, can that work on each and every block? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know what are the constraints of actually implementing this property? That's a great question. So. I really love the idea of having a money market where essentially the collateral is split across multiple multiple domains. This is just greater capital efficiency. And now the problem so far with building this type of, of protocols is that let's say you have a bit of collateral on chain A, chain B, and chain C. Let's assume they all settle back to L1. And obviously, if you're taking a loan on chain A and you want to collateralize with some assets on B and C, you need to deliver that message. So you already are constrained by some latency between A and B and A and C. So this is already problematic. And again, you're sending some arbitrary messages. Whereas by using Herodotus and then storage rules in general, you can sort of mutualize this latency across anyone who's interested in this, in this data connection. So the latency will be way, way lower and you only need to interact with chain A. You don't need to send a message from C and, and, and B because the data regarding those two chains is already there. You just need to prove it. So Herodotus will definitely help in introducing this latency and most importantly, providing this, this synchronicity. Like obviously, uh, whoever is building such an application needs to take in mind, okay, there is some minimal latency. For sure, it's way, way better than using native messaging systems, but still I need to account for, okay, before I get the actual proof from the other side, I cannot unlock my collateral or like do a liquidation and so on. Super cool. That wraps up that first episode. As usual, I'll be leaving all the relevant links in the description below. And yeah, Marcelo, if you have anything else to share with the community, feel free to do so. Um, again, I encourage to check out our docs, our GitHub and our Twitter. And yeah, we'll keep you posted there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marcelo. And thank you everyone for uh, watching this podcast. If you actually liked it, feel free to like or subscribe to the channel and leave a comment. And we will see you very soon with some new episodes. Marcelo, thank you so much and see you soon. Thank you.